Service instructions give us recommendations from the manufacturer. Service bulletins detail those points the manufacturer has deemed mandatory. Service letters contain useful supplemental information. And airworthiness directives are mandatory compliance regulations from the Federal Aviation Administration. Follow these guidelines at all points during the initial installation process of your new or rebuilt engine. After your Textron Lycoming engine is mounted, the next step is the initial startup and break-in of the engine. Here's Paul McBride of Textron Lycoming to discuss this important process with you. Prior to shipping your new or rebuilt Lycoming engine, it has successfully passed a factory test run. Once you take delivery of your new engine, follow the initial startup procedure as detailed in the latest revision of the Textron Lycoming Service Instruction 1427. All Lycoming publications are now available on a CD-ROM. We strongly recommend that you review this publication prior to your initial startup and test flight. Some of the highlights of this publication include instructions that will ensure successful startup of your engine. Number one, perform a ground run-up test to ensure proper oil pressure and check for oil and fuel leaks. The purpose of a ground run test performed in the aircraft is to assure that the engine meets all of the specifications, RPMs, manifold pressure, fuel pressure, and fuel flow. Limit your test run to three minutes so that the temperature on the ground will not overheat and cause damage to the engine. Number two, follow the recommended stated procedures for your first test flight, including the description of power settings and the duration for each setting. The purpose for engine break-in is to seat the piston rings and stabilize oil consumption. There isn't any difference or greater difficulty in seating the piston rings of a top overhaul engine versus a complete engine overhaul. You will note in the instruction that in order to seat the piston rings in a newly overhauled engine, you will want to cruise the aircraft at 65 to 75 percent power for the first 50 hours. So if you follow these simple steps, your oil consumption will stabilize and the piston rings will be properly seated. John Hazlett of Ameriflight Incorporated is a specialist in this process. Prior to your test flight, always do a thorough pre-flight as Paul recommended. Pay special attention to cowling security, oil level and dipstick security, spinner security, the things that have been off the airplane for the engine change. Engine test flights should be conducted in daytime VFR conditions. New or freshly overhauled piston engines tend to run hot so you should minimize your ground running time. Remember that carelessness at this stage can cause expensive damage. Coordinate with ATC so you can start up, taxi out, run up, and take off without lengthy ground holds. If necessary to hold, turn the aircraft into the wind and idle at 1300 RPM for maximum cooling. At this point, you can make a normal takeoff. We've moved to the Ameriflight simulator to better illustrate the following steps. Keep in mind that the speeds and power settings that we're using are for a Piper Chieftain. Be sure you use what's appropriate for your airplane. After takeoff, if engine RPM is more than 100 above or below the red line on the tachometer, if manifold pressure goes above expected values on turbocharged engines, or if other abnormal conditions are seen, heard, or felt, reject the takeoff and have the problem checked out by maintenance personnel. As soon as you're above obstacles, accelerate to en route climb speed plus 10 knots for improved engine cooling. Then reduce to climb power at 1,000 feet above ground level but continue to carry the extra speed. You'll also want to coordinate with air traffic control so that you can circle over the airport until reaching 3,000 feet above ground level. This will allow you to make an immediate return if you run into a problem. After reaching 3,000 feet above ground level, it's okay to leave the airport area if engine operation is normal. But remember, the objective is to put some time on the engine and verify its operation. Don't stray far from home. If you have a problem and have to land at another airport, 
it could get expensive. After reaching a suitable cruise altitude, set normal cruise power and mixture for turbocharged engines. For non-turbocharged engines, the procedure is slightly different. In this case, we want to set 24 inches of manifold pressure, 2300 RPM, and one gallon per hour below climb fuel flow. Once every five minutes, cycle the new engine prop twice up to red line, back to 2200, and then reset 2300 RPM. After 20 minutes at this power setting, set normal cruise power and mixture. You should use high cruise power settings for break-in, 65 to 75 percent of rated power. You don't want to baby the engine at this point or the rings won't seat, but keep an eye on cylinder head and oil temperatures. Let's talk for a moment about the steps you'll want to take prior to landing. At Ameriflight, we've developed a stage cooling program designed to reduce the engine stress associated with power reductions. Your aircraft is equipped with an air-cooled engine that's pulling a tremendous amount of power. Unlike the liquid-cooled engine in your car, where you can put the accelerator to the floor and then release it with minimal or no damage, your air-cooled engine reacts very differently to sudden power reductions. Abruptly reducing the power in your aircraft engine causes the various engine parts to cool off and to contract. Since these parts are made out of different kinds of metal, they'll contract at different rates, and this may cause them to crack under the stress. Now, regulating power reductions in a naturally aspirated or unsupercharged engine is important, but it becomes crucial with the turbocharged engine. The concept behind Ameriflight's stage cooling program is to reduce power in small increments in order to give the engine a chance to catch up. Here's how it works. Begin your descent at 500 feet per minute at cruise power. Every one to two minutes, reduce manifold pressure in small increments, two to four inches. Keep repeating this process until you've reached the power setting for traffic pattern entry or final approach. Remember, our main concern here is to avoid abrupt, large power reductions, so in addition to a safe landing, you'll have a sound engine at the conclusion of your initial test flight. Now that you've seen the initial startup and test flight procedures, Paul McBride will explain in more detail the oil recommendations for break-in of your Textron Lycoming engine, as specified in the latest revisions of Service Instruction 1427 and Service Instruction 1014. Although mineral oil was necessary for the break-in process of the old channel or hard chrome cylinder, with the new steel nitrided cylinders on your Textron Lycoming engine, there are several new recommendations. For the correct oil for your application, always check the operator's manual and service instruction 1014. The latest revision of any document is important reference material because the recommendation may have changed since the original owner's manual was issued. All turbocharged engines must be broken in and operated using ashless dispersant oil only, like Aeroshell W100. Your new engine oil, whether mineral or ashless dispersant, should be changed after the first five hours of operation. The next change should occur at 20 hours and again after the next 25 hours. Each time you will clean the screens, cut the filter, and check for metal. We don't recommend performing oil analysis during the break-in process as we usually see varied amounts of chrome and other metals during break-in. Our criteria tells us if oil consumption has stabilized after these 50 hours and there is no appreciable metal being produced, then your new engine is considered broken in. Ben Visser has more to add about oil and your newer rebuilt engine. What is the proper oil consumption for my engine? This is a question I get asked frequently at air shows. In terms of ranges, there really is no right answer. If I say that six to 10 hours per quart is good for a particular engine, 
a customer may complain that he only gets five and a half hours per cord and conclude that his engine has a problem. This is not necessarily true because each engine seeks its own level of oil consumption depending on several factors. Consumption rate depends on the type of oil you use, how the engine is broken in, the type of cylinders it has, and the type of flying the aircraft endures. For example, if the oil consumption is primarily past the rings, your rate can go down if you switch from a single grade oil like Aeroshell W100 to a multi-grade oil such as Aeroshell 15W50. If the oil consumption is going past the intake guides or through leaks, your rate can go up if you switch from a single grade to a multi-grade oil. The absolute level of oil consumption is not the critical factor. A significant change in the rate of oil consumption is what you want to look for. If your engine is using a quart of oil every eight hours and suddenly begins to use a quart every four hours under the same type of service and conditions, you may want to consult your maintenance facility.